Hi everyone and welcome to Conservation Corner, Penny for your thoughts. My name is Celine and I'm a conservation student in the interdepartmental program of the conservation of archaeological and ethnographic materials and this is our booth. Our activity is based off of one that the Getty Institute put together for their own outreach initiatives. And to start us off, I wanted to tell you a little bit about conservation and some of the tools we use. So the American Institute of Conservation defines conservation as encompassing all those actions taken toward the long-term preservation of cultural heritage. Activities include examination, documentation, treatment, and preventative care, each supported by research and education. So we do a lot of different things, and we need a lot of different tools to do that. So I will show you some of what we use. I have gathered here some of the most common tools that a conservator will use, and you're likely to find at least three, if not more of these things, on a conservator's bench. But you also might find some of these things around your own home, like the paintbrushes, for example. You use them to paint, and so do we. But we also use them for other things, like cleaning objects. Hake brushes are particularly good for this, as the bristles on the brush are quite soft and gentle, and this is great when working with delicate objects. Conservators also often use cosmetic sponges for cleaning. This, these can be particularly helpful to clean certain types of grime off of the surface of an object. Another thing you might find around your home that conservators also have in their toolkit are tweezers. You use these to pull out tiny splinters from your hands and things, and we use them also to t handle tiny objects that may have fallen off of a larger object. They help us to maintain control while we're working. Spatulas can also help us to maintain control while we're working, but they can also be used to apply, th apply things to a surface. Another tool that conservators use quite often is what we call a cotton swab. And this can be made to be whatever size a conservator needs by taking a bamboo skewer and a small piece of cotton and rolling it on the tip of the skewer, just like that. When conservators are done, we also will put them in what we like to call a swab jar. And these can be made, as you can see, from different jars that you get while grocery shopping. These are just some of the many tools that conservators have to, at their disposal while working. Hi, my name is Moppy, and I'm going to be telling you something about conservation science. Science is a major component of any conservation practice because a lot of what we do to cultural heritage objects depends on our knowledge of what the object is made of, how it was made, and what kind of condition it is in. Sometimes it can be very difficult to understand what an object is made of because it might be very complex. Just by looking at this mask, we can tell it has some sort of fiber for hair. We can tell it's been painted. And given its context, it is probably made of wood. But what else? How was it put together? Was the fiber tied together with string and stuck to the wood with some sort of glue? What kind of paint is it, really? Was it varnished? Asking these sort of questions helps us understand what to do next in the scientific procedure. To find out what the object is made of, we usually perform a variety of tests. Using a sophisticated system of cameras and lights can be very useful to identify exactly what the object is made of. Here, my friends Jenny and Tamara are using a crime scope to shine a specific wavelength range of light on this mask to take images that reveal important facts about the painting on this mask. Here we can see that under these diagnostic lights, the long nose of this mask appears orange, unlike the rest of the face, which looks more red. This tells us that the nose was actually painted with a different type of red paint than the rest of the face. Another common test to figure out materials is microscopy. Using microscopes can tell us things like whether the hair on the mask is made of human hair or string or another kind of fiber. Fibers from different plants or animals can look very distinct under certain microscopes. As you can see, the human hair 
looks very different from the coconut fiber. So if we can look at the mask's hair under the microscope, we can match it with the correct type of fiber. Sometimes it requires much more than a microscope to really understand the materials in these objects. That's when we have to go elsewhere to use scientific equipment for our study, which are more advanced. For example, these things labeled artifacts that were dug up by archeologists just look like chunks of dirt, but when they were taken to an X-ray facility like this one, an X-ray, they were found to contain some interesting bits of metal you can see here. They were later cleaned by conservators and people were able to study them and better understand the buried culture. By following a procedure of questioning, investigating and treating, conservators are able to properly treat an object. For the investigation, we often need to do multiple tests to be sure about the materials. And sometimes we have to collaborate with other labs to do this. Once we find out the materials that make the object, we can predict how it will behave in the future under different conditions and do what is needed to make sure the object will be safe for a long time. Hi everyone, my name is Jenny and I'm also one of the students here at the UCLA um, Getty program in conservation. I'm going to be walking you through the steps of the activity today, but before we begin, I'd just like to tell you that although I can kind of show you how it starts and what materials you'll need, the entire process will take about one to two weeks um, or however long you want to leave your penny in the water. Um, and to actually see it changing, you're going to have to check in on it every now and then and just see, you know, how it's evolving underwater. So to begin with, um, you're going to need a container like this. This is just your average Tupperware container. Um, you can use another plastic container or a bowl or a cup as long as it's clean. Then of course you're going to need some pennies like this. These are shinier pennies and I prefer to use shiner, shinier pennies because when you put them in water, you can see them a little more obviously when they're changing. And then obviously you're going to need some water. Um, this is just some water that I put into a teacup. And then lastly, you're going to need some table salt. This is just your average table salt you can buy in any grocery store. I also recommend having a piece of paper and a pencil to write down some observations, which we'll go over when we start um, actually doing the activity. So before you begin, you're going to want to take a closer look at some of your pennies. Try and write down their color, their shine, and the texture you feel when you touch them. Also, how clearly can you see these images on the back and the front of the penny? Write them down on your piece of paper and then date it so you know that it's the first observation that you've made before putting your penny into the bath. Once you've made those observations, go ahead and grab your container and just plop your pennies right on in. Take your salt and cover your pennies with the salt. Lastly, take the water and just pour it into the container. Just leave your pennies alone and you wait. Because this activity does take about a week or two for you to start seeing the effects, um, we decided to show you some examples of what you should look for as your penny starts to change. This is the um, bath that we just created and as you can see the pennies haven't changed much um, since they've only been in here for a few minutes. This is a bath that was made about three or four days ago, and while the pennies are still quite shiny, there is some color change, especially around the edges, where you're starting to get a blackened color. Now this penny has been in for a couple of weeks, and is having some definite color changes on both sides where the surface has become much darker and you're starting to see 
little green specks of corrosion appear. Well, there you have it. You have your own little corroded penny. I will now pass this off to Selena Moffey so that they can tell you a little bit more about the science behind corrosion and um, also what conservators do when they find corrosion on one of the objects or art pieces that they are working on. When Jenny put the pennies in salt water, it was the start of a chemical reaction known as corrosion, where metals break down slowly due to the other elements in their environment. You've probably seen corrosion in different forms, like when old bikes get rusty or silver turns black or tarnishes. The green color of the Statue of Liberty is also due to corrosion reaction, which makes the bright, warm metallic color of a copper alloy turn green. When it comes to copper and copper alloys, which is what pennies are made of, the reaction occurs due to the presence of two main agents, the salt and the water. Table salt, as you may already know, is sodium chloride. When this is dissolved in water, it dissociates into sodium and chloride ions. These ions undergo different combinations through reactions and are really good at attacking the copper in the coins. One of the most dangerous reactions for copper and its alloys when it comes to conservation is bronze disease. Bronze disease was originally observed in the copper alloy called bronze, where it was noticed that the green coating would spread across the surface of the bronze object and eventually cover the whole thing. It usually looks like a fuzzy whitish green coating, which is basically the mineral atacamide. Conservators usually have to test this green coating to make sure it's bronze disease because there are more than one type of corrosion on copper-based objects, and some of them are not as dangerous to the object as bronze diseases. A good example is the Statue of Liberty, which is green due to copper corrosion, but it is a passive corrosion, which is why the statue stayed stable for so many years. Bronze disease, on the other hand, is particularly dangerous because it can spread throughout the object, turning it fully green and causing it to crumble and fall apart. The green coating in bronze disease is formed by a series of reactions in copper-based objects. These reactions repeat in a cycle, which can keep going as long as there is copper left in the object, and the salt and the water keeps the reaction active. This is why the green bronze disease is able to spread throughout the object and is called active corrosion. When bronze disease is verified after testing green coating, we make sure to clean the object to remove the coating of active corrosion and check that there is no longer any salt or water for the reaction to continue. This breaks the cycle and allows the copper object to remain stable. I will now pass this off to Celine so she can show you exactly how a conservator cleans corrosion. When this type of bright green corrosion, or bronze disease, that you just learned about happens on objects, conservators clean it off. To do this, we use two main tools. We use scalpels and microscopes. When we're working in the lab, we have much more high-powered microscopes, but for now, this will do. Please do not attempt to clean the pennies with the scalpel at home. We do encourage you to take a closer look at your pennies and see if you can scrape some off the surface with your fingernail or a bamboo skewer if you have one lying around at home. You see on your screens a zoomed out area of one of my corroded pennies. This might not look like a lot of corrosion, but when left unchecked, this will continue to eat away at the original surface of the penny. So conservators clean this corrosion when we see it on objects especially this bright green corrosion, which means that it's active. As I mentioned before, the two main tools that conservators use to clean bronze disease are microscopes and scalpels. The microscopes we have in the lab give us very good definition so that we can very clearly see what we're doing. I will do my best to keep things clear and in focus with this digital microscope, but I apologize if they are not. One of the challenges with working with a microscope 
is that you're not looking directly at your hands. You're looking at what you can see underneath the microscope. And this can sometimes be disorienting. It takes a lot of patience and practice to get it right. You often have to reorient yourself while working as well to make sure that you know where you are on your piece. And so this area, as I said, is zoomed out. Normally, we want to work at a much closer angle. So I will take you in and show you a little bit of what that's like getting set up. Once you pick an area to focus on, you try and see that while it's blurry and just have to find it and get in focus. So here is what I would like to focus on. It's kind of in the center of the penny. And I will take my scalpel, just the edge, and just barely scrape across the surface of the corrosion. I don't want to go too deep because we don't want to hit anything underneath. This can be very delicate, especially when you're just starting. As you can see, it's coming off quite easily, but I'm going very slow because again, I want to make sure that I'm careful not to disturb the surface underneath. While working under the microscope and at high magnification, things can get crowded pretty quickly. So conservators want to make sure that they keep their field of focus clear. And we use a couple of different things, but I will use one of the paintbrushes from earlier to brush away things that I have begun to scrape off and make sure that my working area is clear. Much of the work conservators do is slow and takes a lot of patience. But in the end, it is all worth it. You'll notice earlier I did hit the penny a little bit and that's because I got unfocused and this is why conservators stay in training for quite a long time so that we can learn and make sure not to disturb the surface of original objects. And there we go. A small area of the penny is covered. Thanks for coming to Conservation Corner, Penny for Your Thoughts. We hope you had fun learning about conservation and hope that you try out this experiment at home. And now we're very excited to take any questions you might have.